Welcome to our second presentation on financial ratios and ratio analysis. And here we're going to do some calculations. They're pretty straightforward, folks. Once you've done a few, the rest of them are, are pretty straightforward and easy to do. Trickiest part is finding the numbers, and that means familiarizing yourself with the financial statements. So let's, before we go any further, let's ask you to print out this financial ratios uh, formula sheet because it'll make life a whole lot easier. Because notice that on the financial ratios formula sheet, we have the names of the items we're looking for and where we can find them on the income statement or the balance sheet and the income statement and the like. Uh, some of you can't read that if you're looking at the, on this in your phone, but print that puppy out. And you may want to print out the, uh, the income statement for Fa Sprouts Family Market, Farmer's Market, and the balance sheet. Or just, you know, grab it off the, uh, the screen if you want. But it's just it's nice to have them uh, available to you. So let's start with the profitability ratios. The profitability ratios measure a firm's returns by relating profits to sales, assets, or equity. They're fairly popular, and you probably heard them discussed when you listened. If you did listen, uh, if you didn't, uh, you know, uh, get the PDF file. But if you did listen to the earnings call back in Chapter 3, you probably heard them discuss some of these profitability ratios. Profitability ratios allow one to measure the ability of a firm to earn an adequate return on sales, total assets, equity, and invested capital. So let's take a look at the first one. Very popular. It's called net profit margin, sometimes called after-tax profit margin. This is the rate of profit being earned from earnings after expenses and taxes. And it's very simple. You take the net income, the bottom line <laughs> number on the income statement, and you divide it by the total revenue, the top line number. So let's go grab that, um, where is that puppy? Where is that income statement? There's the income statement for Sprouts Family Market. There's the top line number. 6.837384 billion dollars and where's the bottom line number Two, 258,856,000 so if you do that calculation I did it already I got my cheat sheet already may got a bit check though check because I make mistakes I got 3.79% hmm is that good is that bad Oh, uh, I don't know. What do, we, what do we need to do? We need to compare it to other companies that are similar to Sprouts Family Market. So who's that? Um, probably the closest one is is um, Whole Paycheck. I'm sorry, Whole Foods. But that's owned by Amazon now. So unless Amazon breaks out the numbers just for Whole Foods, it's not you're not going to be able to do a apples to apples comparison. Another company that is similar to Sprouts is um, Aldi. Aldi, which owns Trader Joe's. But again, the Trader Joe's is a little bit different. Um, it's hard, you know, they, they, they find sort of, they've sort of uh, carved out niches for themselves uh, in the uh, grocery business because it's so, it's so competitive. You've got the uh, Walmarts and the Targets. And then you've got the Kroger's, Albertsons, and Vons, and Safeway, and HEB, <laughs> which is really popular in the South. So it's it's difficult. It's difficult to uh, to compare these. But uh, obviously, the higher the better. The higher the better, and it varies greatly from industry to industry. So let's say three point seven nine for a high volume business like. Like in, in groceries, not bad. Now, when you go to Yahoo or Morningstar, you're going to see a different number. And why is that? Typically, they will do trailing 12 months. What we're doing is we're just looking for the entire year of 2023. Well, here it is in October of 2024. 
So we're ignoring the first nine months of 2024. So what you will normally see is TTM, stands for trailing 12 months. And as of, um, what's today, the 3rd? Yeah, the 3rd of October, Yahoo was reporting 4.52%, which is a little bit better. And I was uh, nosing around at some of the numbers, and it looks as though this year has been pretty darn good so far for Sprouts Family Farmers Mar. I keep calling it Sprouts Family Markets, but it's Sprouts Farm. Well, I just call it Sprouts, okay? You guys, some of you, you shop there. And if you're not from San Diego, if you're not from the San Diego area and you don't have a Sprouts in your area, my apologies. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. What happened to the presentation? Where did it go? Come back here, come back here, come back here. There you are. And so that's the net profit margin. The next one is the growth margin. Because what we're going to do here is we're going to take out the cost of goods sold. We're going to take a look at the income statement and take the gross profit divided by the total revenue. There's that top line number. But in this case, we're going to look at the gross profit. So we take out the cost of goods sold and see how we're doing on just the um, sales without the cost of goods sold. How we how the company's doing without taking into account the cost of goods sold. And you know, it, it's basically the same idea. Take the um, the gross profit, $2.5 billion, divided by the total revenue, 6.8, and you get about, well, I got 36.88%, which kind of makes sense, folks, because that's about what they would want to have a markup of on all their things. You know, not some things are going to, the markup's going to be a lot smaller, some things are going to be a lot higher, but they're in the retail business. They buy wholesale. So they're probably spending about 30% less than what you and I spend because they don't buy one package of diapers. They buy, you know, <laughs> truckloads of them. So they get a much better price. So 36.88%. Again, is that a good number? Is that a bad number? Well, you know, you got to compare it to their competitors which we've already found is a little bit tricky, but not that hard to do if we find a, a competitor that is very similar. But in our case, mm, we have, we have to kind of nose around and see, well, you know, Amazon's going to be a lot different than Walmart. That's going to be a lot different than Target. And uh, they sell very different things, uh, but they also sell groceries. So it's, it's not easy for us with uh with this particular company but other companies it would be much easier and then the operating margin takes it one step further if we go back to the income statement we now re reduce the gross profit by the burden as they're sometimes called the uh the uh the um fixed uh, uh, uh operating costs the operating expenses the selling general and administrative. And so now we're down to 2.171 billion divided by the top line number 6.837 and I get a property I get um I'm sorry oper that's the expenses. I apologize. The income is 350 million. My apologies. I was looking at the expenses. Take 350 million divided by 6.83 billion 37 billion and we get about uh, 5% operating margin which I'm not an expert in grocery stores, but I'm thinking that's probably about right after you've you know, paid for the cost of goods sold, got about a 30%, 35% uh, reduction as opposed to retail, and then paid all your employees and the rent and the, and the uh, utilities and all the other stuff that you have to do just to keep the place afloat. Yeah, about 5% because it's a very... Very, very competitive business. But we would have to, of course, look at our competitors and see how they are doing also. Okay, yep, you guessed it. The higher, the better, and it varies greatly from industry to industry. So when we're looking at a specific company, we always need to look at its competitors within the industry. When we find a company that is atypical of its competitors, 
in an industry, well, that's a signal. That's as we saw with the pre, the PE ratios. We have more investigative work to do. How come this particular company has a much better or much worse number compared to their competitors? The return on assets, and then the next one, return on equity. These are two very popular uh, um, uh, ratios. This return on assets measures how profitable a company is relative to its total assets. So we take that bottom line number, the net income, and this time we divide it by the total assets. Well, remember the net income was about what, $258 million? Well, now that's on the income statement. Now we have to go to the balance sheet to find the total assets. So let's go over to the balance sheet. Come on, sweetheart. Come on, honey. Got to talk nice to my computer. And the total assets being $3.327 billion. The net income, let's let's uh, let's make sure I got that right. It was about 258, as I remember. Yes, of course it was. Come on, come on, sweetheart. Come on. About, yeah, 258 million. And I get a return on accents of 7.78%. The trailing 12 months that is being reported by Yahoo is 8.22%. So things are working out pretty well this year so far for, for Sprouts. Okay, that's not bad. 7.78%. Look at their competitors. See how their competitors are doing. Let's go back to the uh, presentation. Come on. Oh, gee. I am so bad with this thing. There you go. Okay. Return on assets look at the amount of resources a company needs to support operations. It reveals how effective the company is in generating profits from the assets that it has on the books, that it has available. And of course, the higher the better. Very popular ratio compared to its competitors. The next one is return on equity. Hmm, interesting. The return on equity. This is the same idea, but instead of looking at total assets, we look at total stockholders' equity. It's a measure of the overall profitability of a company in relation to the net worth, what the owners own, what the shareholders own, the equity. That's a, another, it's a fancy word for ownership. So we take that bottom line number and we divide it by the total stockholders' equity. Well, where do we find the total stockholders' equity? Of course, on the balance sheet. We run down to the bottom here. And the total stockholders' equity, $1.148 billion. 547, write down the whole thing if you want. And we divide that into that bottom line number on the income statement, the 258 that we saw. And what do we get? What do we get for return on equity? Uh, a very respectable 22.54%. Uh, Yahoo's reporting uh, for the for you know this time of year, 27.7%. So it's been a good year for Sprouts. Because return on equity uses stockholders' equity instead of total assets for the denominator, the return on equity is sensitive to the amount of debt a company is carrying. So specifically. If a company carries a great amount of debt, the return on equity will be much larger than the return on assets. And you might hear people say this, you are using other people's money to make your money. You, can, you might hear the term leverage or lever, using the debt as a lever. We'll come back to this idea throughout the semester because it's very important. It's a two-edged sword. Some investors view this positively. Yeah, we're using somebody else's money to make our money. But what's the other? We got to pay it back, right? We got <laughs> we have to pay the um, the uh, the interest payments, and we have to pay the, the 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 debt payments as they come due. So it's a two-edged sword, and we'll see this throughout the semester that debt can be very helpful to you to generating income. But it also can be uh, dangerous, especially if things don't go as well as they normally you would expect them to. Well, you're looking at a, you know, a grocery store. It's not like they're going to be that affected by it in a recession or 
But some other companies, yeah, they might be. Now, this next one is a very popular uh, um, measure with uh, uh, Warren Buffett and others. And there's a few different versions of it. Okay, There's a few different versions of it, and we're using the most simplistic. The return on invested capital. This is the measure of the overall profitability of a company in relation to both the debt and the equity. Whereas the return on assets was looking at just, you know, the, the assets, the return on equity was looking at the debt and the equity. But this one adds the two. You take the net income, take any dividends out that you, you paid your investors, and then add the long-term debt to the total stockholder's equity. And as we said, return on invested capital is used by many long-term investors such as Warren Buffett. There's a few different versions. We're using the most simplest one. By using both long-term debt and stockholders' equity, the return on invested capital measures how well a company is managing all the capital the company needs to earn its profits. So we've got to find the net income, which is on the um, income statement, the dividends, which is also on the income statement, subtract those two, and then on the bottom, Take the long-term debt and add it to the total stockholder's equity. And I get, uh, I'm going to let you do this one. You, you hope you can find those. If you can't find them, you'll contact me, of course. But you're going to, this is where you, it gets a little tricky, sniffing out where those numbers are on the balance sheet and the income statement. So I get a little over 10%, 10.16%, which again is for a, comp a very stable company, such as a grocery store, I think is a, you know, pretty decent return on invested capital, okay? So you, I'm going to leave it to you to find, we know where the net income is. We found that at the bottom line. The dividends are on the income statement, and then we find the long-term debt on the balance sheet and the total stockholders' equity on the balance sheet, and then plug those numbers in, and I get 10.16. Okay, so those were the profitability ratios. Now we're going to turn our attention to what are called the liquidity ratios. And these ratios are measuring the firm's ability to meet their day-to-day -day operating expenses. In other words, can you make payroll? Because <laughs> if you don't pay your employees, they have a tendency to disappear. Or can you make the rent payments or the insurance payments as they're due? There are two very popular ratios, the current ratio and the acid test ratio. This one in the middle is really not a ratio, so it's sort of the odd duck in our in our list of uh, ratios. It's actually a it's the current ratio in absolute dollar terms. We use the balance sheet for these uh, ratios. So let's take a look at the very popular current ratio. Remember, current assets, current liabilities. The 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 accountants say anything that's due within a year. We're going to use up within a year, that's a current asset, and anything that's due within a year, that's a current liability. And it's a good indicator of how stable a company is. Anything over one is normally considered acceptable. If your current assets equal or exceed your current liabilities, you should be able to satisfy your short-term obligations without any problems. Obviously, the greater the number is, the better. Some of these tech companies with cash coming out of their ears have current ratios in the hundreds. It's just insane. But let's take a look at, at um, uh, the balance sheet for Sprouts, and we'll see that Sprouts is in good shape. They don't have to worry. They don't have to worry. What are their current assets? Let's see if I can move this over a little bit. Make it a little bit. Okay, there's the current assets. Cash, accounts receivable, inventory, 603 million. What's their current liabilities? Accounts payable, the, the debt coming due, other current liabilities, 547 or so. And so when we do that, when we put the current assets over the current liabilities, we get a little over one. 1.104 1 is what I got. Check it out. 1.104. So, um, so yeah, Sprouts is in no danger of being hauled off to, to bankruptcy court, they can pay their current liabilities with their current assets. There is a second, oh, before we go into the second version, 
let's now take a look at the uh, the um, networking capital. Well, this is actually the same thing we just looked at, but in dollar terms. We see it's not a it's not a uh, it's not a ratio. You take the current assets and you subtract the current liabilities. It kind of like thinking your your checkbook in the beginning of the month. Okay, I'm going to have you know four thousand dollars this month coming in the door assets, and I'm going to have you know thirty four hundred dollars in current liabilities. I'll have a net working capital of of a positive number six hundred dollars. Well, in this case, it's you know millions of dollars. <laughs> So we take the uh, $603 million and subtract the $546 million, and you get about $57 million. So they have plenty of net working capital. You see, it's just the uh, current ratio in uh, dollar terms. If the current assets were less than the current liabilities, you'd have a negative number. You know... A lot of it depends on your individual company, but that's usually that's not necessarily a bad sign, depending on what you uh, how you run your company. But certainly, anything above one one point oh in the current assets or any positive networking capital makes you helps you sleep better at night. Okay, this statistic is less popular than the current ratio, and as we said, it's really not a ratio but is often discussed when discussing the current ratio and other liquidity ratios. Now, the next ratio has a great name, right? Acid test ratio, or sometimes called the quick ratio. Now, what, what's going on here? Well, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing, except we pull out the inventory. Now, here's the formula you're going to see. I like to just say, take the current assets, the total current assets, and subtract the inventory. I just think it's a hell of a lot easier. Okay, so it's up to you. If you want to add the cash and, and the accounts receivable and the short-term investments and the other current assets and divide by that by the current liabilities. But it's easier to just take out the inventory. So let's go back to the balance sheet. See what they have here. They add this guy and this guy and this guy. And well, this guy's zero in this in this instance. Why don't you just take the total current assets? And subtract the inventory because that's really all you're doing. That's what this ratio is all about. Why would they do that? Well, think about it. This ratio measures the ability of a company to meet its short-term obligations even if its current inventory becomes obsolete or undesirable or hence difficult or impossible, impossible to be turned into cash. Now, it's not going to be a big problem for the company like Sprouts. I mean, it's not like the Pampers and the, <laughs> and the milk. Well, the milk gets sell, sells very quickly. If it, you didn't sell it, it would go bad. But for computer companies or any technology companies, oh, yeah, the stuff before it's even built, it's obsolete, right? So uh, Dell was the company that really pioneered this back in the late 80s and then into the 90s, and a lot of other companies followed suit. They would design the computers that they were going to sell, but they don't build it until you order the thing. Right? They build it as the because they don't want to have any inventory of computers because in six months the darn things are obsolete. So this is a measure for companies where the inventory can become obsolete or undesirable or whatever. So let's take a look at what happens if we pull out the inventory of 323 million from the 603 current assets. Well, our acid test ratio drops to a little over 50%, 0.513, which for some companies would be a bit of an alarm bell, wouldn't it? But not for Sprouts. I mean, the stuff in there, assuming people don't just stop. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody said, well, I'm not going to shop at Sprouts anymore, then, of course, the produce would all go bad and the food, some of the stuff on the, the canned stuff will last for two, three years. So, no, it's, it's not a problem with a company like Sprouts. But it could be a problem with more high-tech companies where stuff becomes obsolete quickly. Cool? So those were the liquidity ratios. Now, folks, 
are you getting the idea that it's, this is pretty straightforward? Once you've done a few of them, you can do all of them. And that's why we ask you to do two of each. So let's burn through these a little quicker. Of course, you can always speed up the presentation or just so you get oh, too, bo too bored. Just pause it and come back later. Now let's take a look at the activity ratios. And um, these, are, these are important ratios, folks. These are important ratios because they show you how efficient your firm is, the company is. So that's why they're sometimes called the efficiency ratio. They, used to measure how, they are used to measure how well a firm is managing their assets. So we have the accounts receivable, inventory, and total asset turnovers. We use material, uh, numbers from the balance sheet and the income statement. Activity ratios measure a firm's ability to convert different accounts within their balance sheets into cash or sales. Companies will try to turn their production into cash or sales as fast as possible because this will generally lead to higher revenues. In other words, let's get this stuff out the door and sell new stuff. So let's take a look at the first one, accounts receivable. Now, if you're not familiar with what accounts receivable are, they're basically money that's going to come in the door. You've sold the product already, but you haven't been paid yet. This is not something that we retail uh, customers do. Usually we pay for stuff right away. And even if we pay with a credit card, the vendor uh, gets their money immediately and we have to pay the credit. We pay the credit card company, the bank at the, that ha, is tied to the credit card. But they, you get your money immediately. But business to business, no, that's not how it works. Um, uh, I don't know if you've been in a Rite Aid lately, but a lot of the shelves are empty. Why? Because the vendors are very worried about sending them the goods because Rite Aid could go through bankruptcy and then they wouldn't get paid for all the goods they sent them. So that's an issue. So vend business to business almost always works on accounts receivable. We take the total revenue and we divide it by the accounts receivable. So where is the total revenue? That's the top line number on the income statement and accounts receivable was on the balance sheet under current assets. The higher the number, the better. It indicates the return a company is getting from its investment in accounts receivable, which is not really the best kind of investment. <laughs> By maintaining accounts receivable, firms are indirectly extending interest-free loans to their clients. A high ratio implies that the company operates either on a cash basis or its extension of credit and collection of accounts receivable is efficient. A low ratio implies that the company should reassess its credit policies in order to ensure the timely collection of imported, imported, imparted credit not earning interest for the firm. Or that might just be how the industry works. I worked for the uh, subcontractor the in, and, and a little bit in the... Uh, the Defense Department a million years ago. I was not. I was not in the military. I was not. I was never enlisted. Uh, but I did work for some companies that worked for the Department of Defense, and they they would pay their debts. You know, don't worry, Uncle Sam is going to pay your debt. But he takes a long time to do it. And in the late seventies and into the eighties, Congress, uh, the, many of the Congress people were pinging, you know, uh, bugging the Defense Department to open up the. Uh, the businesses to smaller businesses and okay the defense department you know recruited smaller businesses but then the smaller businesses when they would say they would send an invoice and they'd say okay when are you going to sell it going to pay us well we'll get around to it no wait wait a minute usually you're supposed to pay within 30 60 days no you don't worry we'll get you in. It takes about a year or so why no <laughs> no and that worked fine for general dynamics and raytheon and lockheed martin but it doesn't work for some small business, you know, doing whatever. So uh, my understanding is the Defense Department now is a much, much, much better at paying people quickly. Because I have a saying that I learned many years ago. Fast pay makes for fast friends. So let's take a look at the total revenue divided by the accounts receivable. So what do I got here? Income statement, again, the total revenue being that $6.8 billion dollars. And the um, accounts receivable, where is, where is my, come on, sweetheart, come on, my, my balance sheet. Accounts receivable being um, 
you know, 30 million. So what have we got a huge number, right? Yeah. Counts receivable turnovers, 250, 225. So in other words, you know, mostly it's cash. Mostly people pay immediately for the goods that they buy from, from uh, Sprouts, which makes perfect sense. And next one is going to be similar, but instead of the uh, um, in the, uh, accounts receivable, we're going to take a look at the inventory. The higher the number, the less time an inventory spends, an item spends in inventory, and the better the return the company is able to earn from funds tied up in inventory. As with all ratios, this ratio must be compared against the industry averages. A low turnover implies poor sales and therefore excess inventory. A high ratio implies either strong sales or ineffective inventory buying and maintenance. High inventory levels are unhealthy because they represent an investment with a rate of return of zero. It also opens up the company to trouble in the case of falling prices or obsolete products. And this is the car dealer's dilemma. You want to have as many cars on the lot to get people in and interested in looking at cars, right? But you want to have as few cars on the lot because you're paying for those cars and they haven't sold them yet. So it's a push-me-pull-you situation. And, uh, and you don't really want to have that many uh, cars on the lot because what happens if all of a sudden these cars become, uh, you know, oh, that's, all, that's last year's models. That's why it's always a good idea you know, at the end of the year, the model year, to, um, to, to go, if you're shopping for a new car. And at the end of the month, because they have these quotas that they have to meet, and if they haven't met their quota by the end of the month, they're, okay, we'll, we'll have a good deal for you. So what do we got here? We go to the total revenue, that's that top line number, and the inventory was what? It was about 300 million, right, as I remember. Come on, sweetheart, come on, let's go to the browse. Inventory was, yeah, 323 million, so I get a inventory turnover of 21. What does that mean? Think about it, folks. You walk into a Sprouts and you see it stuck to the gills. And that's the way it, it always is, right? No! <laughs> no! <laughs> there are you know, uh, people who are stocking the shelves all the time. So if they're turning over the inventory 21 times a year, that's basically what it means. The other one was 225 means every you know every every week or so, uh, no, not every week, every two days, every two, they they turn over the asset turnover, but the inventory turnover twenty one times, so there's fifty two weeks, and twenty one is uh, you know it's not quite half of fifty two, it's close, so that means every couple of weeks, right, the inventory is turning over. So you don't see that because you see the you come in and and the place is fully stocked. But at night, the people are stocking it, you know, stocking the shelves all the time. And some things turn over a whole, a whole lot, like milk and diapers and the like. And some other things like the, you know, maybe the uh, um, not so seasonal stuff and the like doesn't turn over that often. But oh, every, every year, uh, Sprouts is turning over their inventory 21 times a year. Okay. And next one is the total asset turnover. This measures the firm's efficiency at using the assets to support sales and revenue. Of course, the higher the number, the better. Companies with low profit margins tend to have high asset turnover. So, for example, milk. You know, they're always selling milk. Those with high profit margins have low asset turnover. So, if how many cars can they sell in a month, right? Because they have a fairly high profit margin on them. Actually, the dealers, boy, the dealers really get treated like crap by the, uh, by the manufacturers. They really don't have a very high profit margin. That's why you always see them tacking on extra two, three thousand dollars because they make more money off the used cars than they do off the new cars. So what do we got here? That's the top line number, the total revenue on the income statement, and the total assets was well, like three billion or so, and so we get a total asset turnover about two, so every six months. They turn over the entire assets of the of the uh, company, and of course we would take a look at their competitors and see how they do. Now, then, last the last and very important uh, group of financial ratios are the leverage ratios, solvency ratios. 
which are kind of similar to those liquidity ratios, but more on a long-term basis. These are financial ratios that are used to measure the amount of debt being used to support operations and the ability of the firm to service its debt. Now, eventually you're going to read, don't read it as the first book, you're going to read The Intelligent Investor, and you're going to see the master at work doing his, uh, his magic with uh, um, financial ratios. And he was a big fan of the second one, the times interest earned. Debt is often referred to as leverage. The idea is you're using other people's money to make your money. You are using the borrowed money as a lever to increase your earnings. And so, as we said, you know, this is great, eh, as long as you can make the payments, because you got to... You, know, you borrow money, people don't get, they get really upset if you don't make the payments and pay them back. When one firm buys another firm using borrowed money, it is often referred to as a leveraged buyout. These became very popular in earnest in the late 1980s where there was a lot of leveraged buyouts and they turned out to not be so good for all, not turned it didn't turn out so well for some of the companies. Uh, recently, uh, 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 Elon Musk of, of uh, SpaceX and Tesla fame bought Twitter, Titter, Bitter, and turned it into X. And he did not use mostly all his money. People thought, oh, he just sold a bunch of Tesla stock. No, he borrowed a lot of that money. And now the bankers and others who funded it are not happy because he spent over $40 billion for the for the program for the company uh, for Titter, and it's now being valued at less than ten billion, like nine billion dollars. So, don't ever say that he's the best businessman. He's a phenomenal entrepreneur, but I don't think he's the best businessman. <laughs> he's great at getting companies up and running, but once they're up and running, oh, maybe not so great. But that's you know that's that's a whole discussion unto itself. So let's take a look at some leverage ratios, debt to equity. The debt to equity ratio is a measure of a company's financial leverage calculated by dividing long-term debt by stock by shareholders, stockholders' equity. It indicates what proportion of equity and debt the company is using to finance its debts. So we're, we're taking a look at the balance sheet and we're taking that long-term debt in the numerator divided by the total stockholders' equity. So let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go to the long-term debt where is that? There's the long-term debt, 1.4 billion or so, and divide it into or by the stockholders' equity. And what did you get here? 121 percent. Wow, that's not something I like to see it less than 50 percent, 30 to 50 percent. My humble opinion, I don't like debt. My motto is make love, not loans. But other people, no, no, no. Pion is too, too. He's a scaredy cat. You're, you're doing fine. The important thing is how many, how can you service that debt? That's the important thing. So a higher debt to equity ratio generally means the company has been aggressive in financing its growth with debt. This can result in lower earnings as a result of the additional interest expense and hence lower taxes. Well, that's cool, right? You got to pay the interest and you get to deduct that from your interest, from your, from your earnings, from your, from your, in, your income and your earnings, and then you pay fewer dollars in taxes. Okay. Sometimes investors use the total li liabilities instead of long-term debt. The lower, the better for the more risk-averse investors. That's me. That's me. That's me speaking in there. Yeah, I don't like to see over 100%. But other people say, don't worry. Don't worry. Look at the times interest earned. In other words, can they pay the interest to service the debt? This is a measure of the ability of a company to meet its fixed interest payments. So if we take the earnings before interest and taxes, that's on the income statement, divided by the interest expense, then we know how many times the year in a year they're going to earn their interest to pay their debts. And what we're going to find is it's it's a ridiculous. It's a, I mean, everybody, anybody would be very happy to have uh, the um, times interest earned that Sprouts has. 
So let's take a look at the income statement again. What's the income before interest and in taxes? $350 million. And look at their interest expense, $6.5 million. So every week, <laughs> the number is like 53, yeah, 50, almost 54, 53.96. Every week, Sprouts earns enough money to pay their mortgage. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like one week's worth of work and you can pay your mortgage for the year? Well, that's 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 why Sprouts is not worried. And you know, P Piano is, because I'm just, just nervous when it comes to debt. But Sprouts is not worried about having a, a debt to equity ratio of 121% because they can make their debt payments very easily. Thank you very much. Sprouts is in no danger of being hauled off to bankruptcy court. As it says, you know, three or four times is good you know, every every you know, every couple every few months, and instead they can do it every week. <laughs> okay, total debt to total assets, another um, another measure of how many debts you have compared to your total assets. So you take the total liabilities on the balance sheet divided by the total assets, measure of how much a company's total assets have been financed by debt. The total debt to total assets includes both short-term and long-term debt. If it varies substantially from that debt-to-equity ratio that we saw in the, you know, a couple of slides ago, the company may be relying heavily on short-term debt, which may denote risk. Think about it. Many young entrepreneurs, how do they finance their business? Through credit cards. <laughs> That's short-term debt. Oh boy, and of course it's more expensive than long-term debt, but no bank's going to send, going to lend them money, and they've already tapped out all their relatives, so that can be a, a big red flag. Now, for bigger companies, it's, you know, they don't, they, they have access to the capital markets. I mean, obviously, you know, Sprouts Family's farmer's market can go to the, to the Wall Street and say, yeah, we want to do a big uh, move into Europe or whatever. Uh, we want to sell a bunch of bonds and take on a big loan, and, you know, people would go, oh, okay, well, they, they, they have a lot of money to pay off their debt, so, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with them. So they would not be using a whole lot of short-term debt to finance their, um, their uh, um, growth. So what do we got here? Total debt to total assets. So take the total liability. This is on the balance sheet. Total liabilities, $2.178 billion. Total assets, $3.327 billion, and we get about 65%, which, again, for me, because I'm so debt-averse, I like it to be a, like 30 or 40, but that's just me. I'm just nervous all the time. <laughs> and then our last one, total debt to capitalization. It's, a, it's similar to the, the, one, the two we, we just looked at. It's a measure of the total amount of the outstanding company's debt as a percentage of the firm's total capitalization. So it's just a little bit more involved. It's not, it's, you have to do the short-term debt plus the long-term debt, and you divide that by the short-term debt plus the long-term debt plus the shareholder's equity, and you just you know find the numbers on the balance sheet and plug them all in. Similar to the total debt-to-equity ratio. As with the other debt ratios, the higher the debt level, the more at risk of insolvency. However, some industries with high rates of debt, such as utilities, also have more reliable earnings. So, okay, you know, yeah, utility has to borrow tons of money to, to, uh, to, to operate, but they're also not going anywhere. As always, we must compare our results with the competitors and the industry as a whole. And that, dear students, are you still awake? <laughs> and that, dear students, is our discussion of financial statements, and ratio analysis. Now, your assignment is to take, I don't know, two or three companies. I asked for at least two. And I gave you five companies to play with. I just We don't want you to do real small companies. We want you to do larger companies. But if you want to do a small company, fine. It's up to you. It's just going to be harder to get really good data. And the data might be a little strange because small companies, you know, sometimes, you know, they're in always in dire straits, straits of being uh, dragged off the bankruptcy court. So, but do at least two of the 
uh, common stock ratios, the profitability ratios, the liquidity ratios, the turnover ratios, activity ratios, and the uh, the, the uh, leverage ratios. Okay, to do two of each. Don't just go and find all the common stock ratios, which you can look up and just write them down. Because once you once you've done a, as we said, once you've done a few, it's eh, not too hard to do the rest. Cool. Okay. So next chapter. Think of how much you're learning. Oh my goodness, you are so awesome. We're going to take a look at what's called the market efficiency theory, sometimes called the rational market theory. And we're going to ask a very simple question. Who can beat the market? Can anybody beat the market? We'll see. Thank you so much for being in our class, dear students. We are so proud of you. You are awesome investment gurus.